Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fall 2022 edition of the Transceiver Speaker Series, hosted by the New School Policy and Design for Outer Space and the Program in Global Studies at the New School. My name is Nick Travellini. I'm a, a former co-chair of the uh, of the organization and am so grateful to have been allowed uh, by <laughs> permitted uh, by the student um, of, the, of the club uh, to help organize uh, this transceiver series for the fall. Um, and we are so excited to welcome as the first speaker in this series, Professor, excuse me, Professor Rachel Armstrong. Uh, she's Professor of Regenerative Architecture at KU Leuven, I think I pronounced that correctly, uh, in Belgium, uh, and has worked on a number of fascinating books and projects throughout her, her long and illustrious career. Um, and, and most notably for us as a space-oriented organization, uh, including uh, the book Star Arc, which we've been reading in a reading group. And Rachel has actually been, been joining us and discussing that work with us. And so thank you for, for participating in that. It's been wonderful to learn from you in that context. And we're so excited to welcome you to speak today as part of Transceiver. Uh, so thank you so much for attending. Thank you to everyone who's coming out to attend. And with that, I'll hand the mic over to Okay, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm just going to um, uh, share my screen. It's actually been a great deal of fun uh, working with Nick on the uh, uh, Space Arc reading group. Um, and so I'm going to um, do something a little different and, and I can talk about it um, uh, in the question and answer session. So I, I, I really want you uh, to think about what you're seeing and hearing. And um, yeah, definitely want you to ask questions. So the title of my talk is Space, but not as we know it. I'm going to start with a quote from Oliver Morton uh, from 2003, which says, a world like ours, except for the emptiness. On a soggy planet way beyond this solar system is a small cluster of dwellings that provides refuge for pioneering explorers called Newmans. Diurnally, they descend to the planet's surface in dandelion seed-like capsules from its artificial moon. From time to time, they are joined in their terraforming activities by oddlings who are not quite Newman, being much older and stranger, with a sprightlier stride and a quicker eye for new signs of life. After traveling for centuries to establish themselves on the planet Glyes 581G, the Newmans found it uninhabitable and renamed it Nostalgia. Confined to their world ship, which became the planet's first artificial moon, the most urgent terraforming task was consensually identified by their brightest minds, quantum calculated and designed in laboratory experiments. Finally, they debated it in parliament. Sprinkling precious dirt from their homeland into the planet's atmosphere, the first explorers carried a host of their culture's most precious native seeds into nostalgia's hostile landscape. When combined with the surface liquids, these highly modified creeping chemistries that had been extensively altered for survival went native with spectacular outcomes. Now, slithering scoundrels flop gaping out of the silt and flap tirelessly on the beach, beginning an evolutionary race to gain a colonizing foothold on the hallowed dry land. The sentinels, who have only just evolved their magnificent tri-legs, which raise their skinny bodies out of the puddles, scream, no room, and pick off the scoundrels in droves as they flail helplessly in the effort to dirt, uh, dry dirt upgrade. Such frantic events make the planet sound like it's teeming with life when it's not. Contrary to the sentinels claim, there is plenty of room. 
Nevertheless, the ecosystem is fragile. And if it was not for the Newmans, then a few billion more years might have passed before the carbon rich silts lapped at the shores of warm little ponds yielded any life forms at all. Once loosed, however, the Newman's laboratory cultures metabolized nostalgia's clays and dirts, eating themselves into existence. Every evening, in the 30-hour diurnal cycle that is precision marked by the gazer clock, intrepid Newman's stroll down to the brimstone lake and dip their bread with a giant spoon into the simmering waters so they can feast upon the protein-rich pinworms that devour the succulent bait, activating their one collective neuron. The feeding frenzy glows so prettily as they swarm. As lovely as their thin thoughts might be, pinworms weave no memory of the previous night's feast and learn nothing about their fate. Devouring the bread made by the Newmans from flour that is carefully ground from the leftovers from pinworth pinworm feasts, their pending demise is marked by a joyous mating ritual that transfers their amalgamated neuron into the single soul of a gelatinous soup of eggs. Yes, it's a strange place, but no stranger than the planet from which the Newmans once hailed. A former blue watery planet where the ice caps had long melted and the only remaining evidence there were ever oceans was a steam-clogged atmosphere that spewed torrential rain, which evaporated the moment it reached the ground. Their evolutionary ancestors descended from a billionaire elite species called humans, built their world ship from space debris at the conveniences of their private survival bunkers to flee their dying planet. As the world ship was ripped from Earth's orbit by its nuclear fusion engines, the already nostalgia-struck explorers huddled around the single optical portal for one last fleeting view of their home and were disappointed. Instead of a farewell view of the pale blue dot of legend, a shrinking greyish mass they initially assumed was their moon, snarled good riddance. Scarred by the creeping cracks of vast gullies, Poisoned by leaking piles of toxic plastic and gnawed by steaming flash floods, their home planet's ecosystems had already collapsed into an eyeless subterranean existence and turned their back on them. Fantastic voyages to other worlds and what adventures they hold are as old as storytelling. In the modern age, we write our dreams beyond the world of stories using advanced technologies to transcribe our imaginations into physical forms. It is impossible to say which leads, reality or our imaginations, since the two are so tightly coupled that philosophers are unlikely to ever need to worry about their own obsolescence. Surfing the tidal time wave of change requires agile thinking beyond our conventions, customs and constants as well as our ability to act on these visions. Almost a quarter of the way into the first century of a new millennium, the popular cultural imagination is primed within a condition of comfortable familiarity that satiates consumers and a sense of entitlement in exploiting Earth's resources. Rather magically, these never really run out, but get more expensive as our vice-like grip on industrial processes scar gayer with toxic landscapes and pollute a breath with poisons in ways that as Rachel Carson observes, are not yet quite fatal. While futurists look to the horizon or scan the blue sky seeking solutions to the conditions faced by humanity in the 21st century, they seldom seek to explore the black sky for insights and boldly probe the possibilities of the unknown, clinging to constants like gravity, a strong magnetic field that shields us from the solar wind, a planet that orbits in the same plane and the same direction over 24 hours, that is composed of the same chemical elements and obeys the same physical laws of motion, energy, electricity and magnetism with extensive deposits of liquid at the triple point of water. We believe that the principles of this wonderful fragile world are repeatable elsewhere in the universe. 
We dream through technology accordingly, proposing that dead planets can be vitalized using nuclear bombs and promote the same kinds of business opportunities that make sense on Earth. As Elon Musk says, people will want to create the first pizza joint on Mars, the first iron ore factory, and there will be different things on Mars than we've ever imagined on Earth. Reality and our relationship to it is quintessentially earthbound. When I first presented this talk, I was writing an edited book called Star Arc. As now, interstellar exploration was considered a folly, as many more immediate problems of Earth's livability existed that needed fixing using our tried and tested approaches. When these established methods are actually part of the problem itself, it's time to take Einstein's advice and step outside of our comfortable cognitive space that gave rise to the issues we face in the first place and plunge into the abyss of black sky thinking, not as a self-destructive act, but as a creative tactic to uncover fertile terrains that may inform the choices and actions of our current and future generations, both on Earth and maybe one day amongst the stars. I love this idea of black sky thinking. It reminds me of Marina Benjamin's line from Rocket Dreams when she says, when we dream of space, we dream of transcendence. We dream of what we might become, like a caterpillar before turning itself into a butterfly. We need to create the conditions for a cultural inflection point. We need to realize that we are evolution becoming self-directed. We need to realize that what it means to be human is to transcend our boundaries. We didn't stay in the caves. We won't stay within the biological straitjacket of our current skin bag. We transcend our boundaries. We use our technological scaffoldings to turn ourselves into something far greater than what we were. Black sky thinking is a call to upgrade ourselves. It means that what it means to be human is to transform and transcend. That's what, I, what really turns me on about this notion of black sky thinking. And that's why I think it's worth celebrating. Technological singularities propose that the nature of humanity itself will change at certain tipping points in machine evolution. In fact, in the last 30 years or so, advances in biotechnology have collapsed the gap between technology and nature at a rate that Steve Jurvetson observes exceeds that of Moore's law. And with the advent of synthetic biology, which is the design and engineering of living things, we can start to think of nature itself as being a technology. Now with the convergence of the living world with technology, we can imagine a new Cambrian explosion of species, which may be as amazing and as diverse as the original evolutionary event itself. Kurt Van Mensburg describes a next nature as a design fabric 
that evolves alongside of us, which is a seamless entanglement of technology and culture and ecology. Now, if we are to experience a nature singularity, then we cannot accept that its outcomes are unknown. We depend so much on our environment for our own future that we must learn how to design and engineer with a technology of nature so that we can construct and shape our own environmental futures. Now, this takes us beyond the theories that have proposed the singularity in the first place and enables us to venture into an unknown space that we can call the black sky. So black sky thinking inhabits a realm beyond the singularities and it enables to, us to do this by helping us navigate a space in a way that requires us to be experimental, propositional and creative. Now we do this as explorers, but not in a reckless way, but in a creative way, where we start to weave together the probable um, existence threads around us so that we can start to reshape and reimagine our futures. Black sky thinking, therefore, is a way of constructing radically new futures. The only question now is just how bold are your dreams? So if we are to survive our damaged planet, conceptually and physically, then we must master the art of welding. And before we can leave the planet for the sake of human advancement or expansion, then we first need to consider what it means to be earthbound. Now earthbound is a term used by Bruno Latour to describe humans that recognize the Earth's ecology as being integral to their identity. Earthbound, therefore, depicts a cultural condition for those generations that are always heading for Earth, as they are unable to escape its materiality and its laws. In interstellar terms, we are Earthbound, being tied to and shaped by our materiality and seeking other habitable Earths, which will promote our survival. Perhaps we may even carry our native terrestrial soils with us, like Dracula, so that we may flourish in lands way beyond our origins. Um, leader for Persephone, which is one of the Icarus interstellar projects that catalyzes the construction of a crude interstellar craft within a hundred years. So it's, part, it's in conversation with the 100 year spaceship um, project. And it, I'm responsible for the design and implementation of a living interior to the world ship. So although the details of Icarus Interstellar have not been formalized, the ideas that I'm going to share now uh, are in relationship to the design and engineering of a slow, wet world ship. You might even imagine this soggy interior as being, in a very physical sense, alive. If it is to survive interstellar travel over evolutionary timescales, which may exceed over a thousand years, then it will need to gather extra resources from extraterrestrial sites. But where do you start in designing and developing a living interior for such a vessel? And the vital technologies for a world ship do not depend on mechanical systems alone, but also on soft nature-based ones, like the ones, for example, that circle the outer surface of our own planet and even penetrate through its crusts. And they carry out the useful work of metabolism. They challenge our notions of control through their innate agency. 
And if we are going to sustain a living system, then we need these agencies to help our environment from reaching equilibrium. So in a bottom-up, constructed, circularly sustainable environment, the design and engineering priorities are to preserve flow and flux rather than maintaining the integrity of a hierarchical series of objects, as in the case of machines. But once ecopoiesis has begun and living systems are established within a niche environment, they bring many unique features that increase survivability, such as robustness, flexibility, the ability to deal with unexpected events, creativity, the capacity for propagation, and the propensity to adapt and evolve, even when there is a relatively limited flow of exchange, as in a troglodyte cave. In thinking about evolutionary timescales, they are most frequently depicted in space operas as modifications of current humans and machines, where the surroundings, the living spaces and world ships are taken as a constant. But in space, the fate of the earthbound is tightly coupled to more than just their machines. When they evolve, it is with their whole ecology. And while we do not factor this in in a terrestrial setting, it is critical to take a holistic view for long-term space colonization or settlement, word I prefer. Persephone therefore aims to deal with world ship habitats as extended human ecosystems and as a point of reflection on our current ecological challenges. For each human cell in the body, there is another that is non-human. These collections of microbes are called the human biome or microbiome. And they appear to be critical to our health, nutrition, and even in regulating our moods. We consider these relationships as being symbiotic in a terrestrial environment, but we have no idea what happens to them over prolonged time periods in world ships, especially as bacteria evolve much faster than we do. Well, not quite no idea. The salmonella pathogen has been shown to increase its virulence three to seven times under reduced gravity in the ISS as a result of fluid shear, which makes the bacteria think they're inside a gut. However, from an ecosystem's perspective, Persephone is also aware of the difficult task it faces as a new kid on the block in the challenging legacy of biosphere design. Richard Buckminster Fuller, viewed the Earth as a well-provisioned ship on which we sail through space, a neatly cling film wrap pool blade, the pale blue dot, um, surrounded by a dark murky universe that is separated from the cosmic fabric by an ex exalted earthness. But David Deutsch has criticized Fuller's lyrical idea of spaceship Earth as a harmonious habitat afloat in a barren cosmos as being difficult to defend, even metaphorically. In only 4.5 billion years, our sun will become a bad-tempered red giant prone to cosmic fits of ill temper that will swallow us whole. Deutsch echoes Darwin's view of the world governed by a nature that is red in tooth and claw, and while it creates, is also ready to tear our world apart. The first real effort to create a terrestrial arc to demonstrate that careful management alone can produce functional closed systems was the Soviet BIOS 3 series of experiments that ran from 1972 to 1984. They supported a community of three people supported by an algal cultivator and a phytron where sunlight was stimulated to grow wheat and vegetables. Now, while BIOS 3 demonstrated that chlorella algae could produce oxygen and it was possible to recycle up to 85% of the water in the system, it was not a closed biosphere. Dried meat and energy were provided from external sources and human waste was stored instead of being recycled back into the system. The mission was attempted again with Biosphere 2 in the 1990s that aimed to understand how people in close confines in a closed ecological system could work together over a sustained period. And yet it was quickly clear that despite being equipped with a desert rainforest and ocean, it was gonna be very difficult to create a sustainable environment. Oxygen levels steadily fell, the ocean acidified, internal temperatures rose, carbon dioxide levels fluctuated, vertebrates and pollinating insects died, whilst the crew became depressed, dysfunctional and malnourished. Only the cockroaches and ants thrived. Of course, there's nothing sustainable 
about closed systems, despite McDonough and Brangart's success with promoting their industrially friendly cradle to cradle approach. The truth is that closed systems with living things in them are coffins and will ultimately grind down to an entropic halt. Regardless of the attractive view that Fuller paints of our world, Earth is not and never has been an entirely closed system. It gets external energy, lots of it, from the sun, and is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays, one of the sources of mutation and variation in our DNA. And for those who would like to insist that the Earth is closed because effectively no matter leaves the planet, other than the notable exceptions of space telescopes, ro robots, kilograms of bacteria, and piles of space junk, it is perhaps worth remembering Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. This elegant concept describes matter and energy as different versions of the same thing. So in physical terms, our planet being soaked in sunlight can be regarded as receiving a continual flow of quantum matter. The Earth receives many cosmic packages in a more familiar material form as meteoroids, uh, meteorites, asteroids and cosmic dust. Our planet is being rained on from space. The majority of meteors that bombarded the Earth are little more than particles of dust. Larger ones enter the Earth at, at Earth's atmosphere and rapidly burn up to form small meteors and micrometeorites. 10,000 tons of this extraterrestrial shrapnel falls on the Earth every day. Admittedly, this more spectacular large-scale material payloads are no longer so frequent in the vacuum of space that they're abundant, but they're not that rare in the history of the Earth, especially during the Hadean, where Paul Davis notes that the Earth's oceans were leftovers from intense asteroid bombardment. In proposing a living interior for a world ship, which contains living things, the system needs to be imagined and designed as an open transactional system, feasting on an open cosmic system of cosmic foods, such as electromagnetic spectra and dirty asteroids, or it will become the universe's most beautifully designed and best traveled compost heap. If we can build a world ship to operate within, there is an either even uh, deeper issue to address, which relates to the way that we design and engineer with lifelike systems. In 1948, Erwin Schrodinger noticed that the characteristics of life um, resist the decay towards entropic equilibrium. This observation is profoundly important when thinking about the design of an environment for living things, as it requires us to consider far from equilibrium conditions as the substrate for our inventions. This flies in the face of all our design efforts in history, because when we design, we generally assume that our surroundings are at equilibrium and therefore we are engaged in a, uh, in a world of making objects. But if we look at the very large and small scales of existence, this object-centered version of reality does not hold true. When the atom was split last century, strange subatomic particle worms were released into reality and into our imaginations as leptons, bosons and hadrons. And when we dive down into the nature of these massless specks of matter, they are anything but still, existing as probabilistic clouds of nearly nothingness. Their essence is so primitive that they do not exist in nature and can only be experienced in the most indirect way of seeing anything ever. In the biggest switch, Swiss watch ever made, the Large Hadron Collider, a whole particle superhighway, is dedicated to evidencing the imperceptible. Buried 100 metres underneath the Swiss-French border, the LHC viewing platforms orchestrate minuscule Ballardian fantasies by smashing primordial plasma streams of hydrogen and lead ions into one another. As the particles shatter in layers upon layers of thick sensate materials, sophisticated algorithms interpret their screams from the wreckage and translate them into digital visualizations. And once you've witnessed the screams of a particle dying, how can anything around you ever be still again? In building a new world, Persephone is invoking the existence of a new nature, 
And if we are to design a space that supports dynamic systems, then we must learn to effectively deal with design at non-equilibrium states and create environments with material flows whose cultural equivalent is dirt. Design hates dirt as it is aesthetically and materially subversive. Yet the various forms of dirt, such as shit, grit and dust, when combined, have powerful transformative potential. In space, shit is surprisingly useful. Dennis Taito ship will protect its astronauts from cosmic radiation using food and water, which contains more radiation absorbing atoms than metal. And since organic matter blocks rather than absorbs the radiation, it apparently also remains safe to eat. The lucky married couple's excrement will gradually replace these larder supplies during their round trip to Mars, scheduled once for 2018. Yet practical development of the concept was needed, so Taito's space honeymooners and generations after them didn't find themselves in a round trip to a substandard hotel in Benidorm full of unpleasant sights and smells. However, these concepts add ecological depth to the idea of space travel. More than 90% of wastewater can be recovered using membrane filtering techniques and indigestible fiber in human feces can be transformed into material that resembles an adobe brick wall. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane gas and water vapor can also be harvested. And whilst these processes are not cost effective in short missions, in long term missions where systems are effectively closed, these approaches are increasingly valuable. Therefore, when building for worldship interiors, it is worth remembering that all civilizations are founded on their relationship with the potent transformer that we call soil. Persephone's first task is to identify her native soils, to transform and develop them into subjects worthy of design, exquisite stuff that is not simply a life support system, but provides the very context and meaning for living processes. Soils are a living web of relationships within complex bodies that will eventually grow old and die. Plants take root in the rich chemical medium and bind the particles together to attract animal life. Conversely, soil harbors fungi and bacteria that break down the bodies of dead creatures and turns them into more soil. The speed of this dynamic conversion process varies. In fertile areas, it may take 50 years to produce a few centimeters of soil, but in harsh deserts, it can take thousands of years. Soils are biological cities. They house, nourish, and provide the vital infrastructure for terrestrial life, which laid the foundations for the establishment of ecosystems, the evolution of humans, and the construction of the built environment. The rich complexity of soil systems provides a model and literal substate, substrate for a built environment that can self-maintain and connect with ecological systems. On the face of it, it may appear a straightforward thing to grow a soil, like we might construct a building. Soil scientists observe how we can mix the various particles, adjust the acidity, compost the organic substrate, and bring these organic and inorganic worlds together. But making a soil is more than measuring ingredients for a recipe. They are composed of matter that possesses vibrancy and vivid hues of the rainbow, which embody the poetry of symbiosis. And perhaps most importantly, they are our binding contract with nature. But how can we forge a contract with nature in space where no native biology is known to exist, only physics and chemistry? Over the last decade, I've been working with uh, living chemistries and synthetic biologies, shaping materials that possess a will and a force of their own, independently of a central program or my design and engineering programs. These materials have formed primitive dynamic cell-like structures or protocells. I've been able to clump these primitive chemical assemblages into oily vessels to punctuate a cybernetic hylozoic ground where they fix carbon dioxide from gas hungry solutions. I've used gravity to infiltrate gel like matrices that creep towards the ground producing lesergang rings of chemical separation and reconciliation.
And I've exploited the relentless splitting of crystals into rhizomatous mucus fronds, which lengthen and grow when entangled with carbohydrate polymers. More recently, I've cultivated microbes within different kinds of bioreactors to establish the kinds of transactional systems found in the soil. And I've built prototype living spaces from these systems, as well as communication systems where microbes and people can converse. Persephone proposes to create her soils before she even contemplates the possibility of life by applying the physical and chemical principles of their native environment. She aims to, to develop an architectural practice of natural computing, a term inspired by Alan Turing's interest in the computational powers of nature to produce a new kind of spontaneously self-organizing and autopoietic system that is unique to the worldship. Persephone will harness the creativity of matter and develop the potential for computing at, with matter at different scales, using the parallel processing power of chemistry to create a condition of fertility that, within definable lim limits of probability, may give rise to its own lifelike events. Soil is a probabilistic matrix that is peppered with events and flows within which life is not inevitable but increasingly feasible. It inserts time and space into chemical systems so that potent conditions are delayed from reaching equilibrium and happen again and again and again. Soil hosts many chemical events that arise from the horizontal coupling between dynamic systems. It may give rise to living things by facilitating chemical assemblages such as Stuart Kaufman's autocatalytic sets. It offers a fertile field in which living things are anthropogenically midwifed into existence by farming technologies. Yet while life is the event by which we may measure the success of soils, it is the product of a multitude of partnerships that form the heaving, squirming mass of soil bodies. Soils are the site of huge amounts of metabolic work, which shape the muck that decides where the ecosystems will thrive and ultimately produces the conditions that give rise to cities. And here, Persephone's challenges begin. And although this presentation began with a story, the project itself is real and fully intends to go beyond fiction, proposing that the way of opening up new worlds is first through the imagination where uncertainty is a driver for radical creativity in a probabilistic cosmic landscape, the black sky. Whatever the odds of Persephone's success in her endeavors, she is aware that she will not triumph because of the odds, but in spite of them. Indeed, the only way to guarantee her and our own existence is simply to take our continued existence for granted and hand over control to the ants and cockroaches without trying anything new or daring at all. And now, the oddlings looked up at the sky under the green reflected light of their artificial moon, simply called Newman. Sometimes they could see the stars twinkling between the cracks in its regolith and asteroid shell and at other times they wondered how things might change when all the other Newmans came down to settle nostalgia's surface. Each night, little changed. The pinworms continued to swim brainlessly in the brimstone. The scoundrels floundered, and the sentinels wrapped their long necks around their tri-legs as they settled down for ten long hours sleep before the dawn, dawn broke and all the metabolic slithering started again. That is the end of this uh, presentation and I'm leaving you with a quote, a provocative quote from Oliver Morton. They will not be a new story's beginning, rather the creation of a new chapter. Their expectations and hopes are already being created on the earth today. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Professor Armstrong. That was amazing and the quote was so beautiful. Uh, now the floor is open for the participants to ask any questions that they have. You could either raise your hand with the raise hand feature on Zoom, or you could just type it in the chat and I can relay it for you.
um actually i had a question myself today uh, that uh, we hear a lot about the anthropocene period going on and you were talking about earthbound how do you think that th those two things are related because a lot of people are talking about how the impacts of human is irreversible now and yeah so I, I think that the Anthropocene and the Earthbound, if we go to uh, Latour's work, um, Facing Gaia, for example, um, the Anthropocene is the legacy of um, humans that are not Earthbound. In other words, their Titan is the machine. Um, and so working with machine logic, they elevate themselves from the ground that nurtures them um, and uh, gives kind of uh, cultural permission uh, for its exploitation. So the, the Anthropocene, I think, um, uh, does feature in uh, what we see of space today. I think particularly in uh, Elon Musk's um, kind of wild and woolly uh, visions for Mars, uh, because he's taking the, bar uh, the, the baggage of the industrial era, which he's thrived on and trying to uh, uh, transpose that uh, to a barren planet and that just isn't going to work. The earth bound is really recognizing our relationships with soil and environment and our obligate relationships with those. So in some ways, the uh, ethos of the Anthropocene to sever those to exploit them is completely at odds. And this is the tension that um, uh, Latour raises in uh, in his Facing Gaia series. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, our uh, our shared experience is one of the Anthropocene, and it is very hard to um, to even know exactly how many of those imaginaries have kind of subconsciously primed our thinking. And so, in some ways, this 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 idea of the black sky, or, or even the kind of consideration of welding or a Welshship, whatever vehicle you use in order to um, really try to see anew and and kind of value the things that um, you want to draw towards yourself uh, to promote enlivening, your personal enlivening, the enlivening of the people that you love, but also the spaces in which we live. Um, and the Anthropocene is really about um, assimilating power. So it's, it's a kind of a different direction. You know, we are as, uh, asserting the power of the human, particularly this, this thing in the head, this, um, this kind of over-promoted organ, the human mind. <laughs> and, and I say that not because I don't enjoy the human mind. It's just because I think that intelligence is incredibly situated. And this human mind in an ant's body would be absolutely useless. Um, and that ant's mind in my body, you know, equivalently useless. So, um, so, so in, in some ways, the, the earthbound is trying to break the pyrad, pyramid, pyramid, pyramid of structure that um, uh, has been set up since the Enlightenment. So the Anthropocene is really uh, um, the leftovers of Enlightenment thinking. Not that it didn't provide, you know, insights and things. I'm, I'm not so down on you know to say oh the enlightenment was all bad it wasn't but it did benefit a very small fraction of the of, of you know it really benefits a small fraction of people on earth it uh, benefits you know much more others but uh, there's a there's a huge number of people that don't benefit from the enlightenment at all and that's why this kind of more inclusive notion of starting with the soils and it kind of taking a more humble view of the relationship between uh, you know, ourselves and the planet and other species, I think is a is a really good uh, starting point for resetting our imaginary so that we may be able to see and innovate in new spaces. Yeah, thank you so much. Also, uh, nowadays, that a lot of countries are researching upon space and trying different ways. Uh, some countries are adopting space agriculture as a method because bacteria grows faster in space or has a different effect on plants and bacteria. So do you think it's a safe option considering we're not really sure about uh, how it mutates the object and we're not really sure about the research that goes into it? Yeah, I, I think there's there are... Um... It's important that we do the research, put it that way. I'm not an anti-science person. I want to just very clearly say that I love science. Um, I think that we have to uh, 
retain a degree of criticality when we're applying science that works on earth um, to our imaginaries that you know try to create a space for thinking you know beyond the earth's physical and chemical um, uh, laws so i think it's important like biosphere 2 like bios 3 as imperfect as they they are it's important that we run these experiments it's important that we that we are present you know with the knowledge and the the data that comes out of these uh, you know um, embodied questions um so I think I think you know we've got hydroponics to a point where um, we're really talking about adopting the technologies in cities, um, specifically in response to um, you know failing soils. You know, two percent of the earth is uh, um, you know uh, covered by fertile soil. The rest of it, you know, requires fertilizers, um, and so hydroponics has been seen as a way of uh, really continuing to feed our populations whilst you know the climate collapses. There's a big challenge with uh, hydroponics. It doesn't suit all plants. Uh, it also has a tenuous relationship with soil in the sense that it's a kind of diluted soil with only the uh, nutrients that uh, the human imagination thinks that uh, plants need for proper metabolism. The big challenge is nitrogen metabolism, because as you may know, that this requires bacteria. Um, you know, in order to make nitrites into biologically usable forms, you need um, uh, nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria. And this is where hydroponics starts to uh, become interesting for me that the plants that are grown in these systems do not have root rhizomes, you know, root microbiomes, uh, rhizobiomes. Um, so um, the question then is, can we develop prosthetic uh, microbiomes for for roots, and just as in the question that you know people like Lokesh Joshi and and uh, others that you know sent the salmonella uh, to the ISS in reduced gravity, the salmonella thinks it's in the gut and becomes incredibly virulent. So what might happen to you know prosthetic microbes, which really are the you know the fundamental um, material computers that that underpin the biosphere. Um, so, so agriculture and the relationship to the microbial world uh, is um, a, a very interesting and ongoing question. The, the story of the microbiome kind of begins around about 2001 with Lederberg and Al. So um, it's still quite a new story and not all the questions have been asked of it. We're starting to see that the relationship between you know, multicellular organisms and microbes is you know, not all the time, but it's largely obligate. We can't do without microbes. And on the other hand, you know, microbes of the wrong sort, uh, you know, are opportunistic and uh, can be uh, pathogenic. So um, will agriculture, as we understand it on the earth, uh, or even through the technologically mediated hydroponics, be a solution to um, world ship um, food uh, and resource sustainability? I imagine it is part of a challenge, but it will bring its other own challenges. You know, for example, how do we keep the water flowing through those systems? You know, we might need, uh, so one of the big problems with um, uh, uh, space interiors is that the machinery breaks down. Um, you, know, you, you want as many soft systems as possible without parts that wear out. So that's why the, you know, the uh, ISS astronauts are kind of going around fixing everything uh, because wear and, wear and tear is an ongoing issue. So uh, hydroponics, I think, would be uh, very interesting as a kind of, you know, 21st century, maybe 22nd century kind of plumbing, but it won't be the entire story. We have to entangle it back to some kind of, uh, dirt and organic matter and you know microbial um, systems. So hydroponics cool, um, but it's a it's a partial solution I think, and I think we need to see it within other kinds of situated contexts because the uncertainty of hydroponics is very much protected uh, on Earth uh, by situating it in you, you know in, in terrestrial environments. Thank you so much once again, Professor Ramshan. Uh, seeing that there are no more questions on the floor, I think this marks the end of the event. Thank you all so much for being here. And once again, thank you so much.
Okay, well, thank you so much for spending your time with me. And uh, um, uh, yeah, thank you for being a lovely audience and, and for the invitation. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.